The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome to today's webinar entitled Historic Slate Roofing, Repair or Replacement. My name is Billy Zadig, Manager Special Programs for APA. Just a couple housekeeping items before we get started. The webinar recording will be posted to the APA webpage under the Continuous Learning tab later today. Professional Continuing Education Certificates are being offered for today's program. Those who indicated they wanted a certificate at registration and meet the requirements will receive certificates later this afternoon. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Please type your questions in the chat box and they will be answered in the order they are received. If we run out of time and we still have questions, responses will be sent directly to the person asking the question by our presenter. At this time, it's my pleasure to turn this over to Chelsea Griffin Knott, our speaker for today's webinar. Chelsea, take it away. Thank you for that introduction. So here we go. So here are our learning objectives for the presentation today, and feel free to read through these. We'll cover all of these topics through the course of the presentation, but I know that APA is really a group of, of people who manage educational facilities and keeping that in mind, I know that sometimes you have the funding to work with designers and architects and sometimes you have to work directly with contractors. So really the goal of this presentation is to give you an understanding of slate roofing in general and specifically historic slate roofing and just knowing when you need to perform repairs or pursue a full replacement project. So starting at the very beginning with what is slate. So slate is a metamorphic rock originally formed from a sedimentary rock called shale. So thinking back to grade school, we have three different types of rocks. We have sedimentary rocks formed from sediments building up over time. Then we have igneous rocks, which are formed from lava. And then we have metamorphic rocks, which are either sedimentary or igneous rocks that are exposed to temperatures and pressures that cause their composition to change. And slate is one of these. So the temperatures and pressures that form slate are due to tectonic plate movements and specifically the building of mountains, which is what we're, we're showing in the center graphic here. Then if you look at the images on the bottom, at the bottom left, we're, we're giving you an idea of that original sedimentary stone building up over time. And those sediments create the layers known as the bedding plane of that original stone. Then as the stone is exposed to the temperatures and pressures, it starts to change, which we're seeing in the second and third graphics here. And those temperatures and pressures cause what's known as the cleavage plane of the slate, which is, that layer that slate is famous for, where it'll break off into those thin sheets, those are what's known as the cleavage plane. What I really want to point out here is just that the cleavage plane and the bedding plane are two separate entities that typically form at angles to each other. So sometimes you'll see pieces of slate that have these ribbons of color, and that's you getting a view of the original bedding planes, of that original sedimentary stone. So as I said, slate forms during mountain formation. And in the US, that is typically along the Appalachian Mountains on the East Coast. So prior to 1915, there were over 200 quarries operating all up and down the mountain chain. But nowadays, there's only about 20 total um, currently operating, primarily in the Northeast region, with Vermont being one of the biggest modern day producers of slate. So when we talk about slate, obviously there's all sorts of different colors that we could be working with here and different regions are famous for the colors available there. For example, Vermont is pretty well known for gray, black, green, and purple varieties of slate. And New York is relatively famous for the bright red colored slate. And I believe that's the only area where you can find that color of slate today. And when we talk about slate color, an important idea is this idea of fading versus unfading or weathering and non-weathering slate. So you may have a slate roof when it's freshly installed that looks similar to the image in the upper left here, all consistent, one same color. But over the course of days, months, years, 
it may start to look more like the image on the bottom right here, a shift to lighter shades of gray and even shades of brown. This is what we would consider a fading or weathering variety of slate. It really just means that the colors will, will change a bit over time. And it's important to note that this does not mean that this slate is of any lesser quality. It's really just an aesthetic choice that's important to be aware of, whether you're performing repair or replacement work. What you want to keep an eye out for is slate that starts to look like this image over time, because this is indicative of ferrous deposits in the slate that are starting to oxidize with exposure to the elements, which then is resulting in slate breakage. So here's a few examples of the different slate ripping patterns you might see. We're probably all familiar with your traditional rectangular shaped slate. The slate can also be cut into um, a different exposed edge. So here in the left two images, we're seeing some scalloped edges on the slate. And in that second image there, you're seeing that bright red slate that typically comes from New York. So now to get a bit into the history of slate, so you'll see this timeline starts around 1300. This is around when the people of Wales really started to develop a systematic approach to quarrying slate and using it as a roofing product. I will say that there is evidence of slate being used as a roofing material dating all the way back to Roman times, but I start this timeline around here because the people of Wales are really famous for, for their slate roofing. Then in the 1600s, we see slate roofing start to move to the states as people from the UK immigrate to America and specifically people from Wales. And during this time period, 1600s, all of the slate being used in the US was still coming from the UK. So as you can imagine, pretty costly and pretty time consuming to get those materials. This directly leads to the first commercial slate quarry opening up in Pennsylvania in the US in 1785. And then as you can imagine, that's a cascading effect. More quarries open over time. And then we see the peak of slave roofing in America, generally considered to be between 1880 and 1940. So that brings us into the 1900s here. And we see around 1910, the first asphalt roofing shingles become available and starts to compete with slate in the roofing market. Then in 1926, we see the formation of the National Slate Association, but this association quickly dissolves just due to a lack of organization and cohesion in the industry. And if we look at what's right around the corner in the 30s and 40s, slate starts to decline in America due to Great Depression and world wars. Obviously less emphasis on new building construction and, and even maintenance. Then in the 1950s, we see some of those first generations of asphalt shingles begin to fail, and people realize slate and asphalt shingles are not really a one-to-one -one replacement. With asphalt shingles, you're lucky to get, you know, 30 years relative around that, around that time um, out of them as a product. Whereas with slate, if a slate roof is properly installed, you'll get something from 75 to 100 years, or there's even slate roofs that are much not a one-to-one -one equal. In 1966, we see the National Register of Historic Places is created, and obviously this puts an emphasis on preserving historic buildings and historic slave roofs. Then in the 1970s, we see a revival of slate due to the oil crisis. Asphalt shingles are an oil-based product, so as they become less available and more expensive, people kind of start to turn back to slate as a material and and revive that appreciation. In 2002, we see the reformation of the National Slate Association, and they continue to be a relevant entity to this day. What I want to point out in this timeline is we have a bit of a gap here between the decline of slate roofing in the 30s and 40s, and then the revival in the 1970s. And as you can imagine, during this time period, there's some knowledge loss between generations of roofers and obviously just a lot fewer roofers in general who are able to do this kind of work very well. So if you have a roof that you know was installed in this time period and you're, you're having issues with it, there might be larger construction issues going on just in terms of craftsmanship and, and knowledge. 
So now to talk a bit more about historic buildings in particular. So with historic buildings, you may already be aware that your building is historic or you may not. So it's always a good idea if you have a suspicion that it might be you know, a historically important building to do a bit of research and, and see if you can find anything. So a good place to start is the National Register, the National Register of Historic Places database. This is available online, pretty easy to navigate. You can search by building name or address, and it'll pop up some, some interesting information, potentially some, some plans or historic photos or, or forms. But obviously, this is for the National Register, and not all buildings have significance on the national level. Some buildings only have significance at the state or even local level, so it's good to check um, those entities as well. And this is all important because it'll start to give you an idea of who might need to be involved in your repair or replacement project. You'll know kind of what jurisdictions are gonna want to, to have some say. So this here is um, what the system that Massachusetts has that maps out all of their historic buildings and zones. They call it MACRIS. So this works very similar to the National Registers database, except it's more of like a searchable map, but all of these individual like shaded areas and symbols that we're seeing here all indicate either a historic building or a building that has been surveyed for its potential historic significance. So a lot of states have a very similar website that you can use as a resource. So now these two documents here are, are very important as you start to think about a repair or replacement project. So starting with this document on the left, the Secretary of the Interior Standards for the Treatment of Historic Properties. This is put out by the National Park Service. And this document is really important because typically if you receive any kind of federal funding for your project, whether that be grants or tax incentives, you may be required to follow these guidelines. And depending on the, the profile of, of your building, you might even be assigned someone from the National Park Service to make sure that you're adhering to these guidelines in your work. And you'll see I have some snippets from this document scattered throughout the presentation, but they tend to be really general. They don't get into the nitty gritty of how repairs should be performed for individual systems. They're really more of an idea of just best general practice. Then looking to this document on the right here, this is where we start to get into a bit more detail. This is also put out by the National Park Service. This is what they call a technical preservation brief. There's actually 50 of them, all available online for free. This one is obviously about historic slate roofing, but there's other topics, including like historic wood windows, historic concrete. So it's a good place to go for, for a design resource. And these start to get into a bit more history of these individual systems and then start to get into a bit more detail of preferred repairs and when you should start thinking about replacement for some of these elements. And obviously, in addition to those, there are tons of resources out there for slate roofing in particular and sheet metal elements that typically go along with slate roofing. These are just a few examples. Um, typically, if you have a design professional involved in your project, they'll be able to help you navigate these to get the, the roof system that you want. So now for the question of repair or replacement. So this is a snippet that comes from the Secretary of the Interior Standards. And you'll see from the highlighted uh, keywords here that they really recommend only limited replacement of severely deteriorated elements. So if you think about that, it makes sense. With a historic building, you really want to save as much of the original historic material as you possibly can. So you want to start to look at your building thinking about repairs first and then replacement as the, as the second option. So when you're thinking about repair or replacement, you want to start to look at slate defects. So you want to look out for things like missing pieces of slate, like we're seeing here in this first image, chipped pieces of slate, slate that are displaced and look like they may fall in the future, slate that are cracked, 
And then in this last image here, we're seeing a missing piece of slate. There's a cracked piece of slate right in the center there. And then it looks like there's some pits in the middle of that piece of slate as well. So all of these are, are pieces of slate that really should be replaced. And when you start to see these defects, you want to place them on your roof to get an idea of how much of the existing slate requires repairs. And the threshold that you want to keep in mind is 20%. And this actually comes directly from the preservation brief that I brought up earlier. Once you have 20% or more of the slate on your roof requiring repairs, it starts to become more economic to fully remove and replace the roof system than try and tackle all of these individual repairs for a number of reasons. I mean, access, trafficking the slate, it just like the, the costs just don't really add up over this threshold. And you'll see that a lot of the slate that I've circled here just have chips at the corner. That's a very common slate defect that we see. And we often get asked, how you know how big of a chip is too much so typically anything larger than inch by inch like what we're showing here is something that you would want to replace and that's because any larger chips than that start to run the risk of water being able to travel into that lower course of slate below the one with the chip and potentially that water can find its way to fastening holes or between the joints in the slate and eventually find its way into your building interior but when thinking about the slate roof, there's there's other things to consider. For example, things like lichen growth. So lichens often attach to slate and they actually excrete an acid that can deteriorate the slate and they're very difficult to remove. So if you have widespread lichen growth, but your slate below still look fine, you might want to think about those larger areas actually requiring replacement. In addition to that, you want to take a look at the sheet metal elements associated with your slate roof system. In this place, in this case, we're looking at copper, and, and copper and slate often go together. And we see this hip cap is deformed. It looks like it's displacing. It looks like it could use, um, use replacing. And when we're talking about copper, we also want to keep an eye out for, for how copper changes as it ages. So we're all pretty familiar with copper when it's firstly installed, is this bright, bronzy, brown color, but over time it develops that green patina that it's famous for. But as copper starts to, to age past that patina, what happens is the patina starts to wear away and the slate starts to revert back to this dull, brownish, grayish color. And sometimes you'll see something like this, streaks where the patina is starting to potentially wear away. Often if you're seeing copper that looks like this, you'll start to find pits along, along the elements and, and that's a dead giveaway that the copper is past its useful life and, and should be replaced. And as I kind of alluded to earlier, access is really important when you're thinking about slate repairs versus replacement. Slate as it ages becomes more brittle. So if you need to use scaffolding, similar to the images on the left here, the two images on the left. This will require you to traffic a lot of the roof system to perform those individual repairs, and you'll probably end up breaking more slate along the way. So not every site has, you know, 360 access all around to be able to get everywhere with a lift versus scaffolding like this. So it's just another item that may push you towards, you know, wide, wide scale replacement over individual repairs. And often, you know, designers get brought in to look at slate roofs when they're leaking. You know, that's how most owners <laughs> evaluate the, the performance of their roof systems. But obviously, leaks could be coming from, from different elements beyond just the roof itself. So things like dormers with, with windows and wood trim, like we're seeing in this image on the upper left here, you could have a leak that's really associated with that window, but looks like it's coming from the roof. Similar with the image on the upper right, we have a wide open mortar joint right below the roof line. Could appear like a roof leak, but is actually masonry. And then this bottom photo here is a really low flashing height, and that's really an improper style of flashing for this configuration. You really want step flashing there. 
Um, but this masonry wall could be taking on water that's appearing to be like a roof. So it's good to always do the research and try and identify where your leaks are coming from before you, you know, just go ahead and replace the whole roof. So now to talk a bit about what repairs first labors look like. So this is good advice, whether performing repairs <clears throat> or replacement work, you want to make sure that you're, you know, doing your due diligence, researching the building and its history. And this is important because when you're working on a historic building, you need to restore that building to its period of historic significance, whatever that may be. So we know that buildings tend to change over time. Sometimes people knock down chimneys, add additions for one reason or another. So you need a good idea of of how the building should look when you're done with the work you're doing. Test cuts are always a great idea because it'll give you an idea of what your roof deck looks like. It'll give you an idea of the existing configurations, existing slate sizes, and it'll also give you an opportunity to test for hazardous materials. With slate, you will sometimes find asbestos in the slater cement, especially the red slater cement, which we see in this upper left photo along that tip line between the slate there. That often will be found to be an asbestos-containing material. You can sometimes also find asbestos in old um, roofing belts. So making sure that you do that testing so that you can properly abate those materials is, is really important. And then as I said, taking a look at the roof deck, both from the exterior side and from underneath if possible, because if you do have a leaking roof, it's it's more likely than not that you'll have a bit of damage to that roof deck that should also be addressed with the work that you're doing. And this last side in here is just documenting the existing conditions. It'll only make it easier for you down the line when you're trying to patch things up. So with slate roofs, you might find all sorts of different roof deck configurations. We're probably all the most familiar with wood framing, but that's not all you might see. So this just goes to illustrate why it's so important to make sure you're doing that initial research because all of these different deck types require different fastening, uh, different fasteners, and you need to know that early on. So now I wanted to talk a bit about the different tools that you should see a slate roofer using. If you are working directly with a contractor and you don't see them with these tools, you might want to ask them about it. So Starting with this tool on the left here, this is what's called a slate ripper. And it's typically used for slate repairs. Those two hooks at the very end of the tool are able to hook onto uh, the nails that are holding the slate in place. You can either shear them or, or wiggle them out so that you can get that individual piece of slate loose. Then you'll need the tool on the right here, which is called a slate hammer. And one of the things you really want to see whether your roofer is performing repairs or wide scale replacement is sounding of the slate that they're using. So good quality slate will make a light ring when it's hit with a slate hammer, and poor quality slate will have like a dull thud. And an experienced slate roofer will, will really be able to tell the difference. As you can imagine, slate being a natural material, not every piece in a bunch is, is going to be like the best quality. So sounding is, is a really important process. And then the slate hammer here, obviously the blunt end can be used to, to hammer in new nails for your new pieces of slate, and the back pointed end can be used to, to puncture new holes in the pieces of slate for unique configurations. So now I'm going to talk about two different repair options, and these are the two styles of repairs that are recommended by that technical preservation brief. This first one being what I would consider the, the number one um, preferred repair just because it is mostly invisible once it's installed. So you'll see we start here by removing that original damaged slate shingle. Then we slide our new slate shingle into place. This one should have two fastening holes already punched through the center of it as opposed to being closer to the edges because you need to be able to secure that piece of slate through the joints in the course of slate above. Then you'll basically protect those fasteners with what's called a copper babby. It's just a piece of copper with a crimped edge so that it can kind of hang on the new piece of slate and protect those fasteners from moisture intrusion. And as you can imagine, once this is all installed, 
it really should blend in with the rest of the surrounding slate. The second option is what's called a slate coat repair. It's relatively similar to the first option. Start by removing your bad shingle. Then you'll want to secure down your slate hook. And it's really important that the slate hook gets fastened down to the roof deck and it's not hung on the course of slate below. Slate's not really meant to handle loads like that, like the load of another slate hanging on it, hanging on another piece. Um, so it's really important that that hook is fastened down to the deck. Then once it's installed, you'll slide in your new piece of slate, crimp the edge of that hook onto it, and you're basically done. Um, once installed, this will look similar to the image in the upper right here. You see the little ends of those slate hooks. So again, a little bit more visible than the first repair option we talked about. Another thing you might see is copper tabs used in place of the slate hooks. That's what we're showing in this bottom right photo here. You want to try and avoid copper tabs in areas with sliding snow because sliding snow can typically bend open those copper tabs and then your new repair slates can, can fall out of place. And there are all sorts of improper repairs you might see out there. These are just a few. Uh, so starting with the image on the left here, we see a slate with visible fastening holes. This is a really common repair that we see when roofers don't have stock of new slate on hand to replace broken pieces with. So typically a slate like this will have a broken exposed edge and the roofer basically just flips it around to hide that broken edge but now these fastening holes are visible and the fastening holes are are not <laughs> not what you want to see in your slate roof system because now you've introduced holes into your roof system so as you can imagine water can find its way through those and into your building interior this next image that we see here is a broken piece of slate that looks like it got repaired with some kind of sealant or mastic or slate or cement. And actually a lot of slate design guides will, will recommend using like a slate or cement like this as a temporary repair to stop water from getting into your building. But as a temporary repair, they're not meant to be permanent. So something like this could maybe hold you over hopefully until you're able to get some new slate to be able to repair this properly. Over time, something like this, you know, will start to deteriorate and open up in, you know, in a relatively short period of time. So then our next image here, we see what looks like a ferrous piece of metal it was either installed as part of the original roof system or was used in a repair. And you see that that ferrous metal is already starting to, is already starting to um, show up as like rust stains on, on the slate below. And this is something that's really difficult to clean. So you really want to try and avoid using ferrous metals with, with slate in general. And then our last image here, we see some what looks like bituminous uh, dripping down into the slate. And this is obviously not really a slate defect in and of itself. It looks like that might have come from the roof system above the slate. But it just goes to show that you really need to be aware of adjacent construction as well and how that might affect the performance of your sleep. So this is all just a reminder to say we want to try and pursue repairs whenever we can. But sometimes replacement is the best option. And if you must replace your roof, these are a couple of things to think about. So the first one here, long lead times and higher costs for specialty slate. Depending on the size and the color that you're looking for, it could take up to a year, if not more, to get all of the stock that you might need. So it's just something that you want to make sure you have in the back of your mind that that project might not be able to happen next year. It might have to happen the year after that. And not just slate, but there are also long lead times for copper, particularly heavier weights of copper. And in addition to longer lead times for the raw material itself, if you have any kind of decorative elements on your on your roof that need to be replicated, it will take a lot of time for a craftsman to be able to perform that work. Typically, there's very few people that still do this this kind of thing, so they'll usually have a long wait list. Um, and as you can imagine, you you could be waiting quite a while. And then the last item here is coordination with historic commissions. 
So as I said before, you know, depending on your building and its level of historic significance, you might have to work with some of these commissions and get their input on all of the work that you're doing. So that's, you know, approval of mock-ups, approval of colors, you know, construction meetings, design meetings to make sure that, that everything is aligning the way everyone wants it to. And this is just something that you just typically need to budget some, some extra time and coordination work for. So this is another snippet from the Secretary of the Interior Standards. And this is specifically in regards to replacement work. So what I want to point out here is that if you have a historic building with a historic slate roof, you really want to make sure that you're replacing that original roof with a new slate roof. There are some products out there, asphalt shingles that are made to look like slate or even faux slate that's actually made of plastic um, that try to mimic slate's look. But if you do have a historic building, you're really backed into the corner of, of going back with that original material. So when thinking about replacing your, your roof, one of the first questions might be, what kind of slate should you be using? And that directs you to this ASTM standard, ASTM C406, which actually consists of three separate tests to basically determine slate quality. And those three tests are for depth of softening, which is also known as the weathering of the slate, another for water absorption, and then the last for modulus of rupture or the flexural strength of the slate. And depending on the results of those tests, your slate will be put into either the S1, S2, or S3 categories. And typically for roofing, you want to make sure that you're using S1 slate. And this may even be required by your local building code. So one of the questions we often get is, can any of my existing slate be salvaged? And the answer is, Maybe. Um, in that kind of situation, it's typically a good idea to take down some sample slate from your original roof and subject it to this ASTM C406 testing. If you find that your original slate is still S1 grade, then by all means, it's a possibility. But if you find that you're in the S3 range, only expecting maybe 20 to 40 more years of life out of it, that would be something that you would probably just scrap and go back with all new. But if you are pursuing the slate salvaging option, you should be aware of the extra time and labor that will go into taking down all of the original slate, sounding all of them, cleaning them with any debris, you know, storing them neatly so that they can be reinstalled. So there is definitely some extra cost there. Even if you're saving in raw material, you know, you're still paying for, for labor and time. And another thing to think about when you're considering a full slate replacement is your underlayments. So it should be said that a slate roof, once it's fully installed, it doesn't require any underlayment to shed water. So it's not really necessarily required from a waterproofing standpoint, but again, your local building code may require an underlayment. And it's often beneficial because it protects your roof deck while the new slate system is being installed. And it also provides that you know backup if you do end up having some, some slate damage down the line. So typically the two underlayments we're working with are felt or synthetic. Felt underlayments are typically a bit cheaper, but they're cheaper for a reason. Uh, they typically cannot be exposed to UV light for as long as synthetic underlayments. With felt, you know, you could see some warping or wrinkling after only a few days of exposure in the sun. Whereas a synthetic underlayment can typically be exposed to light for up to 90 days, if not longer. And there's other benefits too. The synthetic underlayment is typically a bit easier to traffic, so sometimes roofers prefer it for that reason. But in addition to these underlayments that are typically used throughout the field of the roof, you'll want to try and install modified bitumen underlayments, which are typically self-adhering membranes at critical points on your roof. So this graphic on the bottom left here shows those typical areas where you would see a modified bitumen underlayment. And the reason we don't typically use it everywhere is because those products are even more expensive than your felt or synthetic underlayments. And it's particularly important to install modified bitumen underlayments under sheet metal elements, which you'll typically see at 
ridges, hips, valleys, eaves, um, because the female elements of your root will start to fail before the slate does. You know, if we're talking 75 to 100 or more years for your slate to really start to fail, copper is never going to be able to last that long. So the modified bitumen undulamins give you that extra layer of protection, you know, should your sheet metal start to fail down the line. And I do want to point out, it's very important to use a high temperature modified bitumen product, particularly under sheet metal elements. You can imagine the sun heating that sheet metal, heats it up to a, to a high temperature. And that can start to almost melt uh, lower temperature modified bitumen products. And you can start to get kind of dark streaks on, on elements below your roof. Sticking with a high temperature product will reduce the potential for that. Another design consideration is snow management. So you might have a historic building that already has a snow management system. But if you don't, you may be experiencing some issues with sliding snow. Slate is a relatively slippery surface. So typically the two systems we'll use for snow management are snow tabs or snow rails. What you often see with historic slate roofs are the snow tabs shown in this bottom left photo here. These are called pigtail snow tabs. Um, they're basically just copper wire in a loop. We often find them deformed like this. Uh, they're really not that robust. They're like a small piece of wire. You can imagine a lot of snow against that, easily bending it out of place. If you are pursuing a full replacement project, you might want to go back with a pre-manufactured style of snow tab, which I'm showing in the center photo here. And you may be thinking, well, if it's a historic building, do we really want to change the look of, of this snow management system? And obviously, if you're adding this to a building that doesn't already have these, you know, that's a significant change. But it can be worth it in some instances if you are having significant sliding snow issues, because sliding snow can, can hurt people, can damage property. So snow management is, is really important. So another option is snow rails, which we have an image of on the bottom right here. Snow rails, you can imagine, because they're all connected to each other, they can hold a lot of weight of snow. They typically require some structural augmentation to support them. So it's typically easiest to install snow rails if you have an existing wood roof deck, because it's easy to access from the exterior. You can just remove a couple of individual planks, add some supplementary wood framing, which we're showing in this tail snippet here, and then you know put your roof planks back, and then your snow rails are all set. This may not be possible if you're dealing with a gypsum or cementitious deck. You know, you might just not have the access available. But the best system is typically a combination of both of these to help break up snow and hold it on the roof system so that it doesn't slide off in, in big chunks. Another thing to consider with your slate roofing and your sheet metal elements in particular are galvanic reactions. So galvanic reactions occur when two dissimilar metals are in contact with each other in the presence of an electrolyte, which nowadays is just acidic rain, which is most of the rain we get. What happens is the less reactive uh, metal, um, in this case, metals like lead, copper, and stainless steel, will deteriorate more slowly while the more reactive metal, something like zinc, galvanized steel, or aluminum, will deteriorate more quickly, essentially sacrificing itself for the less reactive metal. So this is why if you have a slate roof system with copper elements, you want to try and stick to using copper fasteners or stainless steel fasteners. Going back with something like zinc or galvanized steel, you're running the risk that those galvanic reactions will deteriorate those fasteners and suddenly you have a much bigger issue on your hands. So now with this slide, there's a couple of things I want to point out. So I'm gonna get my little laser pointer here. So starting with the length of the slate, which is really made up by these two dimensions, exposure and head lap. Exposure is pretty straightforward. It's really just the amount of slate that you see at each course. 
sometimes this will be consistent throughout the field of your roof. Sometimes your exposure will get smaller as you work your way up towards the ridges. Just depends on the pattern that you have. That one's pretty easy. Headlap is a bit more challenging to see. So headlap is how much a third course of slate, so in this case, this piece here, overlaps a first course of slate. So that would be this one down here. And this is important because it basically serves to protect all of these joints in this course of slate below. If you think about this second course, if this piece of slate didn't overlap that one, then we'd have a gap here that water would be able to find its way into. So that is this dimension here. You see how the dashed line lines up. So another important dimension is side lap. That's this three inches minimum that we're showing here. It's important for very similar reasons to why head lap is important. <clears throat> you want to make sure you have enough coverage over your fastening holes that water won't be able to make its way there. And speaking of fastening holes, we typically want to see them one inch minimum from the edge of your piece of slate, but we also don't want to see them any more than one inch really from the edge of the slate, because as you start to get closer to the center of the slate, you're getting closer to this joint in the course of slate above, which is a vulnerable point. But you also don't want this fastening hole to be too close to the edge, because if it is, it could result in breakage. So those are your general dimensions for slate. I also want to quickly take a look at this image here, because this is typically a how a slate roof starts to be installed. You want to make sure you're starting from the eaves and, and working your way up. It's pretty obvious. But it's important that you see a starter course of slate going down, which is this little half piece that we see here. This piece really serves to protect these joints in the first course of slate and helps to create a drip edge that will make sure water is running directly into your gutter and hopefully not working its way back into the roof system. It's also important that you see some kind of wood or sheet metal shim below these first two courses here. This sets up those two at the correct angle with the rest of the roof system. If you think about what would happen with this piece of slate resting on top of this one, but these two resting directly on the roof surface, what you would have between them is a really large gap. And if you do see something like that on your building, it's um, it might be something worth calling a designer to take a look at. Another important consideration with slate installation is nailing. So slate is a bit different from asphalt shingles because it hangs on its nails instead of them being hammered really tight. So under nailing and over nailing can have adverse effects on your slate roof system. So if you have a piece of slate that's under nailed, if that nail is sticking up above the surface of your slate, it will start to put pressure on the piece of slate above which can result in breakage, which is what we're seeing in this first image on the left here. Similarly, if you over nail your slate and it's too tight to the slate that it's securing, you could cause breakage of that piece of slate. So it just depends which one you're potentially breaking. What you want to see is a nail that's either right at the surface of your slate that's being secured or just below. So these are, full, these are highlighted further in the two images that we have. So the nailing of your slate is equally as important. And then if you are considering a full slate roof replacement, you may also want to think of the adjacent elements around your slate roof. So things like chimneys. Um, often we find chimneys with deteriorated mortar going hand in hand with deteriorated slate roof systems. While you have the access available, and while the slate is all cleared out of the way, it's typically a good idea to think about repointing and masonry repairs to your chimneys. Similarly, capping unused chimneys can help reduce moisture intrusion into the, into the building interior, but obviously you want to make sure that those buildings, that those chimneys are in fact no longer being used. You may also want to think about masonry repairs around the roof system, typically around the eaves or around gutters, downspouts. With downspouts, sometimes you'll find downspouts that are connected to subgrade drainage lines. And if that is the case, you'll definitely want to think about 
snaking those subgrade lines before the start of the project and after the project is over. If you have any blockages in those lines, you want to make sure that you know that upfront so you can try and address them. If they don't get addressed, you could end up with, with backup that can deteriorate your brand new downspouts and brand new roof system. You can also think about adding clean out tees, which will make snaking those lines in the future easier. Other than that, you can also think about skylight replacement or restoration, window replacement, restoration. It all depends on your building configuration, but you'll want to make sure that you're taking a look at those adjacent elements in addition to just the slate roof itself. So once you have a newly installed slate roof, again, the Secretary of the Interior Standards recommends basically monitoring your brand new slate roof, making sure that you're going out there, you know, in the fall, once all this debris is coming down after storms, particularly storms with high winds. And really just like, it's a maintenance item, just like any you want to try and tackle the issues that come up as soon as you possibly can. What you don't want to do is let the roof go, then it starts to leak again, and then this again is affecting your building interior. I should say that if you're working with a roofing contractor, you might have a warranty from them for a couple of years um, after the new roof is installed. And you want to make sure that you're you're using that warranty if it if it applies. If you do have some some damage use it while you have it. I will say also that slate suppliers will typically, if you are indeed purchasing S1 slate, will provide a warranty for at least 75 years. But this is really, this really applies to widespread deterioration or just widespread low quality slate, um, which can be tricky to redeem depending on the issues you're experiencing. But it is another resource that is available to you if you are having issues with your brand new system. And if it all goes well, your brand new roof might look something like this. So this is a project that Gail worked on in Massachusetts. It was a full slate replacement project that included replacement of the sheet metal components and also some masonry repairs to the chimneys and below the gutter line. You can see on this section of the roof, we installed new snow tabs. They were actually used in this area because this portion of the building had a terracotta roof deck, whereas the rest of the building where you see snow rails over here had a traditional wood roof deck. And this project in particular actually was not listed on the National Register, it was not listed as a historic building on the local level, but was actually very important to our clients, the town, because it is the building that's included on their town seal. So everyone in the community was really passionate about restoring it to its original glory and restoring it in a way that's true to its historic character. So, you know, even if you don't have a listed historic building, you may still have, you know, a community that wants it to be treated as such. Thank you so much for watching and Please let me know if you have any questions. And Chelsea, we do have questions. Our first okay. question is, what about project repairs made without federal grant funding? If a historic building is owned by an entity other than the federal government and they face daunting costs to replace, can they, cons can they consider an alternative in order to attain closure water tightness to protect yeah. the underlying structure, as opposed to waiting for funds to build for the costly slate roof. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if if you are not accepting any kind of federal grant money, um, you know, there's there's nothing necessarily like holding you to following these standards. If you need to do some kind of repairs just to keep your building from leaking, then that's still in the best in, in the best interest of the building in the long run. You want to try and stop that water from getting inside. So if you have to, you know, do some temporary repairs that's not necessarily true to the historic building, but are what's required at the time, then that's completely understandable. 
And then our next question, it's more of a statement, is removal provides the opportunity to replace felt and to provide ice and water shields? Oh, sorry, can you repeat that one? Removal provides the opportunity to replace felt and to provide ice and water shield. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's the benefit too of, of doing a, a full replacement project. You can access all of those elements get rid of all those old materials and go back with, with something new. And one is one talking about a particular slide. It said, is that a clay tile roof deck? Can you repair, replace slate? Can repair, replace slate be nailed to that? Yes, they can. So it can be a little bit tricky with those terracotta roof decks. They are quite brittle. Um, but the way that we've had success in the past of working with those is using um, like butterfly anchors that you can either like drill through and have the anchor expand on the other side, or you can just drill through and then install the anchor on the interior side. And you can either, you know, fasten, basically use those to fasten wood battens down that you can then nail your slate to a little bit easier than nailing directly to the terracotta. Or you could even use those anchors to install plywood all throughout the deck and then uh, fasten your new slate to the plywood. So it, it is possible. It's just a little bit more tricky. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you walk on slate roof to inspect it without damaging it? You really can't. Um, especially, I mean, slate being a steep slope system, I would not recommend walking on it. Uh, if, if I go out to do a slate evaluation, I'll typically use binoculars, um, just standing at the street level. You might not be able to view everything that way, but it's at least a good start. And then I know in our office, we also use drones for photography, being able to get up above the roof and look at it um, from the top down without having to, to actually traffic the roof itself. So those are the two ways we typically use. Okay, thank you. Our next question is, how often should slate roofs be inspected? And is there a list of qualified inspection entities or credential they should possess? That's a good question. So I would say, I mean, I, at least once in the spring and once in the fall, taking a look at your slate roof, um, in addition to just like visually inspecting it, you also want to make sure you're like cleaning out your gutters, making sure that any debris in the gutters is gone. So you're promoting drainage, making sure that your downspouts are clear. I don't think there's like an easy checklist available, um, but it's really just like the things I was talking about in this presentation. You're looking out for any damage, which with slate is pretty obvious. Any you know, large scale displacement of sheet metal elements and then any areas where water is starting to build up. So I would stick to like those three big items. And, you know, after big storms and at a bare minimum, once in the spring and once in the fall for an inspection. Okay, thank you. Our next question is, is there a list of reputable slate installers available through the National Slate Association or another organization? Yeah, I, I do believe so. Um, I don't know definitively, but I do think that there are slate, there are roofers who have been, who have undergone some kind of training with the National Slate Association or have some kind of verification by them. Um, but also that's something that designers can typically help you with. I know that we have in the back of our minds, the contractors that, that we've had really successful slate projects with. So it's a little bit of experience and a little bit of certification. We have another statement. It says the Secretary of the Interior Bulletins may be the single best source to get anyone up to speed on holistic materials. These things are great. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I completely agree. It's, it's a great resource. Okay, well, that is the end of our, oh, he meant to say historic, not holistic. Sorry about that. <laughs> Anyway, that's the end of our questions for you. Uh, Chelsea, thank you so much. I, I learned a lot about slate roofs because I like slate roofs. Um, so thank you for doing our webinar. 
And to those who are asking about getting presentations, Chelsea will send me her presentation and it will be available uh, as a follow-up in your email uh, that you'll get tomorrow. So uh, again, Chelsea, thank you so much. You are the finale of our 2023 webinar season. So thank you so much for a great ending to all of this. And to our attendees, as always, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us. So as always, let's have a great day, rest of the week, and with the upcoming holiday season, be wonderful to each other. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of 2023. Bye-bye yeah, now. Thank you so much.